For this re lesson, we're going to talk about uh, microbial growth and nutrition. Specifically, we're going to talk about the growth portion of this. Um, so, how do bacteria grow? Well, growth in biology can actually mean two somewhat different things. Uh, one is that an organism can get physically larger, or a cell can get physically larger. And uh, the other is that a population of organisms, or a population of cells, can get more numerous. Um, bacteria, and honestly all living things, do both of these. Uh, but here we're going to more focus around reproduction rather than physical growth. Um, like the way in which bacteria like physically grow, they get like larger, happens, but is not terribly interesting. No real important changes happen other than the fact that they get a bit bigger. Um, when they uh, divide and reproduce, most, not all, but most bacteria uh, do so through what's called binary fission, which is just a very fancy way of saying splitting in two. Um, this is an equilateral split, meaning that one parent cell will split into two roughly equally sized daughter cells. There are a few other methods as well. Uh, for instance, you can have budding, uh, and with budding, let me put this up here, what you have is a parent cell that grows a small cell sort of budding off to it that will then grow larger. and then eventually drop off. And in that situation, you have a mother cell and a daughter cell, and you can tell which is the mother and which is the daughter, right? In, uh, in binary fission, like both of the child cells uh, look functionally the same. Um, in uh, prokaryotic cell division, or at least in bacterial cell division, usually the cell will become larger, and uh, then its genome will replicate. The genome has to replicate first, and the two genomes will separate to opposite poles of the cell, and uh, a ring of proteins that acts kind of like a belt, called the FTSZ ring forms. Uh, it's called the FTSZ ring because it's made out of the protein FTSZ, which works like uh, a belt, right? So like with a belt, um, you can pull it tighter, but it doesn't get looser on its own. So like it can cinch tighter, but it can't be loosened. And so over time, this FTSZ ring, which actually attaches to the membrane around the center of the cell, uh, cinches tighter and tighter and tighter, and it pulls the membrane in with it as it cinches in. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the bacteria will begin building a cleavage furrow in its cell wall. Um, this cleavage furrow will get deeper and deeper, and eventually the FTSZ ring will tighten so much that your um, membranes just sort of collapse, kind of like, if you've ever seen like two soap bubbles collide and go bloop into one big soap bubble, kind of like that, but backwards, All right? You're just pulling them tighter and tighter and tighter until it's just easier for it to split into two soap bubbles. And then you have two cells, and you complete building uh, the new um, cell wall down the middle, at which point the cells uh, will separate and become separate cells. 
they may actually stay kind of hooked to each other. Um, as uh, was discussed a bit in the video on prokaryotic shapes and arrangements, uh, sometimes when, um, when bacteria divide, they don't completely separate, um, but they are two separate cells at this point. This means that every time bacteria reproduce, um, they basically double in number. Now, how long does this take? The answer is, it really depends on the type of cell. Relatively fast growing bacteria like E. coli um, can easily complete this entire process from uh, starting to replicate the genome all the way through completing division in about an hour. Uh, and under ideal circumstances, uh, given like the, you know, huge amounts of the best food and perfect temperature and a perfect oxygen environment, E. coli can complete a generation time in about 20 minutes. And a generation time is the term that we have for the amount of time that it takes uh, a newly divided cell uh, to grow physically uh, to the size that it needs to be and then to complete this whole process again, All right? So the time that you go from a fresh new cell to that cell reproducing is one generation time or one doubling time. So under ideal circumstances for E. coli, this can be like 20 minutes. Uh, there are a few bacteria that can go faster than this, but that's pretty fast. Um, on the other hand, uh, the bacteria uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the bacterium that causes tuberculosis, uh, has a normal generation time of like 24 hours. So it can take an entire 24 hour period to reproduce. And like that might not seem like a huge difference, 20 minutes to 24 hours, but we're gonna see how that actually can make a pretty dramatic difference. So you can um, calculate bacterial growth and at least theoretically how many bacteria will be around if you know the generation time and the number of initial bacteria. And this is the equation that is used to do that, uh, where NT is the number of cells, like that's the total number of cells in the population, and zero is the initial number of cells, and N is the number of doubling times or generation times it has been. So to give an example, if you have 10 cells in your original population and you have 12 generation times, which for E. coli would be about four hours under ideal circumstances. Um, so if you have a 20 minute generation time uh, for the cells, there's three 20 minute periods in an hour. Three times four hours is 12. You have 12 generation times. Then you would have 10 times two to the 12th, which if you get out your calculator and you plug it in, you'll find out is about 41,000. So that's in four hours. Assuming that, uh, um, that uh, your E. coli continue to have a generation time of 20 minutes, um, how many cells would this be in a 24 hour period, all right? Um, well, let's just even get rid of the 10 at the beginning. Let's assume you're starting with one cell, 24 hour period, that is uh, like 12, 20, you know, so 24 times three is, 48, 72, all right? So 
you would have one, so you're just starting with one cell, times two to the 72nd power. So I can't do that one in my head. I'm gonna pop out my phone here. So two to the 72nd power equals uh, 4.7 times 10 to the 21st. That's uh, four, that's no, rounded to five followed by 21 zeros. So like one times, so 10 to the ninth is a billion. 10 to the 12th is a trillion. 10 to the 15th is a quadrillion. And I have no idea what the name is for 10 to the 21st pack. It'd be like a, I don't know, septillion or something stupid like that. Um, at any rate, uh, this is actually a redonkulous amount of cells. Uh, this is like a mass of cells that would be like huge. We're talking about tons of bacteria. Um, and that's starting from one E. coli cell and then you're waiting 24 hours. So obviously this doesn't ever actually happen because cells can't actually grow under ideal conditions without limit, right? It, it's it's going to get like several hours in and it will have eaten all of its available food. And then they will stop growing. Um, but if it was growing without limit, if it was just continuing to double every 20 minutes, we are talking about a huge mass of cells. Um, on the other hand, if you start with one mycobacterium tuberculosa, 24 hours later, you will have two of them. So that's the difference that generation time can make. For E. coli, a day later, you just have a ridiculously huge number of cells that's never actually going to happen. For tuberculosis, you've got a second cell. So the generation time of the organism that you're working with plays a huge factor in how quickly it will grow. And you can just sort of imagine that for any bacteria that causes disease, generation time is actually going to play a pretty important distinction in how long it takes to get sick. Um, like there's a reason why tuberculosis is a disease with a very long lead time. It takes it a lot of time before it actually gets enough bacteria that it can cause you significant problems. Um, whereas something like, say, I don't know, um, strep pneumonia, if it gets into your cerebrospinal fluid, uh, can reproduce quite quickly. When we are growing bacteria in the lab, there is basically two ways that can be grown. Um, one is a batch growth, which is basically where you take some bacteria, you put it in some growth media, and then you let it grow until it's done growing. The other is a continuous growth method. This is where um, you have bacteria growing in a, a, a growth chamber, and you usually have, like, old media that's, like, had all of its nutrients eaten up and is starting to fill up with waste product products, is constantly being drained away, and new, fresh media is constantly being added uh, so that the bacteria will never deplete their resources. This continuous growth method is mostly used in industrial applications. Like if you're using your bacteria to um, like make something and you 
therefore want just bunches and bunches and bunches of bacteria. Uh, under most laboratory conditions, when you grow them, you're growing them in a batch method, which means you take some amount of media, and uh, media is just, a, 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 it's bacteria food, basically. You'll get to that in a um, future video. Uh, you take some amount of media, you add a little bit of bacteria to it, and then you put it in good conditions. Um, usually, if you want to grow a lot of cells, uh, you're going to be putting the bacteria in liquid media because this allows to, the bacteria the most room in which to grow. And uh, you will be usually putting it at the proper temperature. And if your uh, organism is aerobic, uh, then you're going to be usually shaking the tube or the vessel that you're growing it in to mix some air in with it so that it has plenty of oxygen to grow. This is part of generating those ideal conditions that I was talking about. Under these circumstances, um, your bacteria growth will usually follow what is called the growth curve. Uh, I don't want to describe this in a sort of, from the perspective of a bacteria, right? So imagine that you are a bacteria. You are in this place. It is dark. It is cold. There is not much food around. Right? Suddenly, there is a bright light. And some weird guy in a white coat takes you out of your cold environment and plops you down into what, from your perspective, can only be described as paradise. It is huge boundless, goes on for as far as the eyes can see, if you had eyes or could see, which you can't because you're a bacteria. Um, it is full of all of your favorite things to eat. It is exactly the temperature that you love to live at. The air is clear and fresh. You're a bacteria. What are you going to do? Well, you would say you're probably going to eat, right? But it actually takes a little bit of time. To do that. You're coming from a pretty poor environment. You have not been expressing the genes necessary to eat and eat and eat as fast as you possibly can and grow and grow and grow as fast as you possibly can. So you are going to get out your little bacteria knife and fork. Chink, 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 chink. You're going to tuck in your little bacteria napkin and you are going to take a nice deep breath and savor it. So this is what we call the lag phase. lag phase. For the first few minutes after you introduce bacteria into a new environment, they don't grow. And that's because during this time, they are altering their genetic expression. They are taking out their metaphorical bacterial eating tools which means that they're going to be expressing the enzymes that are necessary to digest all of that food. They're gonna start expressing all of the uh, proteins that are necessary to divide and grow. All of that takes time. Genes don't get made instantly. They take, mm, you know, five, maybe 10 minutes, depending upon the species of bacteria. So this lag phase, there's a lot of genetic change going on, but very little growth. And this lasts for minutes. Uh, we're talking about E. coli here, but it's, it's going to be minutes for most bacteria. Now the next stage, you are all prepped. You've done your pre-gaming, you've got your genes all ready to eat food, grow, and divide, and that's what you're going to do. So in the next phase, you eat, 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 and divide, and eat, 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 and divide, eat, 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 divide. And this is what we call the log phase, or the phase of exponential growth. During the log phase, the number of bacterial cells is going to double every generation time, every generation period. 
And so the numbers are going to increase extremely rapidly. They're going to increase according to that equation that I showed you on the last page. Um, this is called the log phase because the, this type of growth is described as being logarithmic. Um, just due to the amount of resources that are there, the log phase cannot last forever. Because even though when you were dropped in, it looked like this boundless, endless fields filled with all of the stuff that you love to eat was just a, a, a bounty. Um, but now, it's not just you. Now it's you and your like 10 quadrillion friends. And within a few generations, suddenly all that boundless space is pretty filled up. And all of that food has mostly been eaten. And there are waste products lying all over the place, uh, poisoning the environment. And that's going to make it difficult to grow. Um, this is a thing that pretty much every organism that grows without limit eventually comes to. And so uh, usually, uh, if we're talking E. coli again, Log phase lasts hours. It depends on how big a tank you put them in, right? So it can be anywhere from like, you know, four or five hours to, you know, uh, 24 hours, right? Like at 24 hours, you're going to have a really massive amount of E. coli, but you could be growing them in a huge tank or something, right? And at the end of this, you are at what's called the log stationary transition. This here, where the population stops growing and levels off, that represents the point at which all of the nutrient resources that were initially present have been depleted. But there is still one nutrient resource left one that wasn't there when you started, each other. And so you enter into stationary phase. During the stationary phase, you still have bacteria growing and reproducing. And you have bacteria dying. And the only way you can get enough resources to grow and reproduce is if another bacteria dies and you eat their dead, decaying body. So during stationary phase, um, New bacteria can only be born when old bacteria die. So the population is dynamic. New cells are continuing to be born much slower than they were during log phase. But new cells are continuing to be born, but only at a rate where it is balanced by the number of cells that are dying. And that means that there is no net increase in the population. Hence, it is stationary. During this phase, you are in a sort of Mad Max hellscape, where all of the bacteria are competing as hard as they can. They may be actively trying to kill each other off. They may not be, depends upon the species. Um, but they are trying to scavenge as hard as they can for any loose resources. Um, and bacteria that die and give up the ghost also give up their nutrients. And those nutrients are what is necessary for other bacteria to continue to grow and thrive. This time, uh, stationary phase, for uh, E. coli, depending upon the circumstances, we're talking about days to weeks. All right. Often you'll take bacteria in the stationary phase and put them in like a cooler environment to slow down their metabolism. That can stretch out that stationary phase for much longer. But unfortunately we inhabit a cruel world and entropy always increases. This is one of the fundamental laws of the universe. 
Uh, entropy always increases. And what this means is that any time you are going to transfer or change energy, such as when you eat something and get energy from it, some of that energy is permanently transformed into an unusable form, usually waste heat. So that means that over time, more and more and more pollutants build up that can't just be easily used. And those nutrients, like from this cell that dies, well, every time you recycle those nutrients, you end up with a little bit less than you started with. So you, you can't have a society that exists solely on eating itself. It just doesn't work. Uh, not in the long run. So eventually you end up with a gradually declining number of available nutrients, even if you're engaging in rampant cannibalism. You also have uh, an ever-increasing number of... Uh, uh, environmental pollutants building up because that's another way that some of those components get turned into waste energy is they get turned into unusable pollutants so in this last phase you enter into prolonged decline or death and this is where more bacteria are dying then are being born. And you've got a couple of different options for what happens here. Some bacteria are going to try to compete harder and harder and harder to try to get uh, that, um, get at that ever decreasing pool of nutrients. But ultimately, this is going to be a losing strategy. Uh, other bacteria go into a state of like basically hibernation or suspended animation. For some bacteria, this is going to be what's called an endospore, where they actually go into complete shutdown um, and protection mode, and they can actually last for hundreds or thousands of years in this dormant state. They're not using any energy, they're not growing, but they're also not dying. Um, not all bacteria can form endospores. Uh, some of them will grow into a, a state of uh, lowered metabolism that's called viable but non-culturable, meaning that they're still alive, but they're not growing and they're not reproducing and they are using as little energy as possible and hoping for a change in environmental conditions, that somebody will come and put some new food in there, or just perhaps another person in a big white coat might take them out of there and plop them down into a new paradise. But inevitably, this death or decline phase, if nothing changes in the environment, this can last weeks to months and even years, especially if the bacteria get stored in a cool environment, um, which encourages them to take the, hey, we're just gonna shut down and try to use as little energy as possible type strategy. I've had bacteria stored uh, in the fridge remain viable for um, up to a year and a half after I stored them. Uh, now, note, most of the bacteria are dead. Like, if I put in some bacteria, there's probably billions of bacterial cells that I stored. And, like, when I go in a year and a half later, there might be only a few hundred of them left alive. But if you start with a few hundred cells and you put them in some fresh media, they will very quickly go back into stationary phase and, um, and soon you will have billions upon billions of the cells again. So it takes them a long time to actually all die off. And actually, as, you, as this stretches from uh, weeks to months, this line actually curves 
out like that. So you can have a few cells that last a really, really long time. Now that's the phases of bacterial growth when they're being grown in the laboratory. So if we say that these cells are in lag phase, you know what's basically going on there. Um, they're changing over their genetic expression, but they're not yet growing. If we say they're in log phase, you know that they're growing very, very rapidly. They're eating very, very rapidly. Uh, if we say they're in lag phase, you know what's going on there. And if we say that they're in death phase, well, you kind of know what's going on with that as well. And that is bacterial growth in the lab.